much for being here this morning. We'll, I'm sure, have some folks come drive right you. in. You. Among those, some I'm related to by marriage. This is I did want to uh, say one quick word. Uh, some of you already know this, but um, Cindy's mom has uh, been, uh, her, she had cancer several years ago. It's returned and it's pretty much everywhere. Uh, it's liver and stomach and and every place. And so uh, she's uh, on hospice as of yesterday uh, in palliative care, and they said weeks, um, don't know for sure, days maybe, but Cindy uh, is leaving this afternoon to fly down to Mississippi, uh, and she'll be coming back uh, next week, but I thought that you would like to know uh, that information. Uh, she's on the prayer list? She's going to be on the prayer list. This happened just after, <laughs> after we printed the prayer list, after publication. So we will certainly get her, get her on the prayer list. So. Um, beyond that, I don't think I have any announcements uh, this morning. So, uh, it's hot. I don't know if anybody's mentioned that. Um, <laughs> it may have come up, but uh, it's warm out there. It's hot, uh, thank God for it. It's hot everywhere. <laughs> so it's supposed to cool off in Mississippi. I was worried about that for her. Um, this morning, I want to talk about Psalm 23. Because there's, what's that? Can I make a brief announcement? Oh, please. Yes, yes, yes. Um, many of you know that. something. I'm sorry that Mark hasn't done his presentation on beauty yet before you had to announce the, the quilt announcement because it would be a really good time the role that faith and beauty play. Um, this week I'm doing Psalm 23 because there's no way that I can do a study on the Psalms and skip Psalm 23. Um, if I was doing a study on the Psalms and skip Psalm 23 we may call a recall vote immediately. In the past. Um, if you don't read it at a funeral, forget it. You've not done the funeral collect correctly. It's going to be a problem if you don't have Psalm 23 is, is beloved. It is the most famous psalm, and it may very well be the most famous scripture that we have in the entire Bible. People know this. It is permeating popular culture in in creative ways. It has found its way into movies. It was in a Twilight Zone episode. It's been in hip hop songs. It is it is in all it is just part of culture. And so that presents a, a real challenge when it comes to trying to teach it. Because a friend of mine years ago said that his philosophy of teaching was that a good teacher makes the familiar unfamiliar and the unfamiliar familiar. Um, when something is this familiar, what can I do to make it unfamiliar? What can I do to help with, because we all know it so very well. So I don't have a lot of notes. I, I thought that I would spend most of the time on this one. Basically, it's, it's appropriate to talk last week about translation and the struggles of translation, the issues of translation, because I kind of want to look at some of the issues of translation in this psalm that might give us some insight into the psalm itself. And so for that, um, just kind of want to look at, at this. I'll read it through first, and then we'll come back. This is the New Revised Standard Version, um, which translation. And this, by the way, is one of those places where the translation needs to be as, as, there are two philosophies of translation. There's what's called formal correspondence and dynamic equivalence. Formal correspondence is when the form of the translation is as close as possible to the original language. So, so usually the formal correspondence translations people talk about are literal, that's what they think of as literal translations. When the word order is almost the same, you try to be consistent when you're translating with one word each time, that sort of thing. Dynamic equivalence is when you're translating more for the meaning of the passage, that you try to do the work of the culture and you want the translation to affect the new audience, the new reader, the way the old text affects the old reader. So you update the metaphors and you update the images and you do things to try to make it more relatable. This, that would be the more, uh, the message is a dynamic equivalence translation. New Living, um, Contemporary English, those usually children's Bibles are uh, dynamic equivalence translations. Even the most dynamic equivalence translation 
still tends toward the formal correspondence on Psalm 23. Uh, this is one of those places where you just, you just can't wander too far from what the King James did or nobody's going to buy your Bible. Um, not that I'm implying money is a motivating factor for people. Uh, I would hate to imply that that's the case. But it, that's what happens. If you, don't, if you wander too far away from, from that King James that everyone memorized for Psalm 23, then, then no one's going to pay any attention to it. So, so this is the New Revised Standard, and you probably will feel very familiar when you grow up with uh, King James. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Uh, I, shame on me, I skipped the uh, superscription. Because, um, you know, I love superscriptions. It's a Psalm of David, in case you were curious. Uh, I want to make sure I get that in. That is actually verse 1 in the, in the Hebrew. Um, a, a Psalm of David. Okay, so, where do you start on this one? Um, we start with shepherd, right? The Lord is my shepherd. That's a metaphor that we've heard. That's a metaphor that we've seen. We saw it in Jesus in the New Testament also. The one thing that we're going to miss that they would have instantly heard when they heard the Lord is my shepherd is that is a thoroughly royal metaphor. They would have heard kingship when they saw shepherd. Um, and that's something we miss. It was very common in the ancient Near East to think of kingship, of kings calling themselves shepherd for their people. That was something that didn't just happen in Israel. It happened in kings of Assyria, kings of Babylon. Uh, in their royal decrees, they spoke of themselves as shepherds. So, so this is one of those places where, you know, just saying the Lord is my shepherd for us it conjures this beautiful pastoral image. But for those early readers, it would have conjured a royal picture. It's one of those, it's, I'm trying to think of a, a good parallel. It's kind of like if I said we're, we're, we're in sudden death. You know I'm talking using a football metaphor. I mean, instantly. That's, that's something you picked up on, even though neither of those words, you know, are, say, football. Okay, those who like football know that I'm using a football <laughs> metaphor. But, I think of it as hockey. Hockey. Hockey works. Um, yeah. Uh, shoot, shoot out, what about extra innings? That would work. If I said extra innings. A walk-off, a walk-off, that's it. See, once again, we need to translate for different cultures. That's important, and Pentecost says we can do that, so it ends up being okay. So, so this is a place where you have that royal, and so all of these images, though they absolutely are pastoral, yes, 100%, and they call that to mind, they are also royal. And so to say the Lord is my shepherd is, is very similar, actually, probably closer than we realize to saying the phrase something like Jesus is Lord. Um, we don't realize saying Jesus is Lord is as political as it is because Jesus is Lord over and against Caesar. Right? Caesar is Lord is the phrase that all Roman citizens would have to proclaim. To say Jesus is Lord is to make a countercultural political statement. The Lord is my shepherd is to make a political statement in this psalm. And we don't hear it very often. God is my king as opposed to the other kings of this world that can fail us in so many ways. So, so I think that this is just one of those places where we, we forget how much culture is between us sometimes. I, I think sometimes we forget that this, this was written for another occasion. Uh, we, we, we tend to just, it's in English, and it's so accessible. We tend to just pick it up and pretend it's speaking right to us. And it can speak right to us, but it spoke to someone else first. And I think it's important to, for me to hear how it spoke. And that's one of those places where I think that's a little helpful. Questions or thoughts or struggles or comments on it? Yeah. This is way off, but I'm just curious. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in Nazi history. Nazi history, okay. Yes, and the King of the Fuhrer. Mm -hmm. And I read that the moment is leader in the sky. Do you have to know Shepherd in the German translation is Fuhrer? Oh, what he used? I don't, is it? I don't know. I don't know. I don't, have a, I don't have the little with me. Um, I'm just curious, but that's I have to look that one up. Yeah, it's, I mean, you have to end up making interesting choices and in calling those to mind. I will say that, that the word shepherd is a, a homonym for uh, the word friend also. Uh, Roi in Hebrew as shepherd and it's friend. They, they all are spelled exactly the same way. And so, um, so I'd be interested to know what Luther chose when he was doing that. Um, that's a good question. 
I, I bet they went with Shepard more than they went with. But yes. When did the Romans first uh, occupy um, Jerusalem or that part of the 63 town? BC. 63. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, or might be 37. 63 was when they got rid of it. So it's in that first century BC, right there. I didn't, I didn't know there'd be a quiz this morning. I didn't know enough on that. Sorry. I will, I'll tell you, I'm going to work on that. Um, he makes me lie down in green pastures and leaves me beside still waters. Obviously, those call to mind those, those pastoral and pastoral images. But the one thing that we're missing there is that is answering the question of I shall not want. Um, in other words, he give, God gives us what we need. That is food and water. Green pastures and still waters is basic necessity for a sheep. <laughs> so, so it's not, again, it's calling to mind the pastoral ideas, but it's doing it to convey it is God who is king, who is providing the needs that we have um, in, this, in this context. I think that's, that's an important part as we walk through that. How are we doing? Okay. I, I don't want to make you not romanticize the psalm, but I guess what I want is the psalm to speak to us in our context more than anything else. So I hope I don't destroy any beautiful pictures you have hanging in your kitchen uh, when, I, when I do this, but it happens. I'll do that with Isaiah 40 sometime for you, but uh, not, not here today. Uh, verse 3, he restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for, for God's name's sake. This is a great one because uh, the word path in Hebrew is the word rut. Um, and so he leads me in the right ruts, in the ruts of righteousness. Uh, I had a sermon that I titled Ruts of Righteousness. Um, this is one of those times when culture gets us in trouble because in English, a rut is not usually a good thing. Right? If you get stuck in a rut, <laughs> your wagon, it's hard to get your wagon out of that thing. Uh, but the, the rut here, it's, it's the well-worn path. It's where people have gone. Um, no matter what Robert Frost might say, the road less traveled is going to get you killed in the ancient world. Um, you want to go on the road that everyone has been on. Uh, the road that everyone has been on is the road that runs to the cities. It's the road that runs to by the water. It's the road that if you fall among thieves, someone will come walking by, um, what hopes, uh, and hopes they stop as opposed to crossing on the other side. Uh, but but it is, it is a, the, the ruts are, the, it's the safe path. It's the path of, of provision. It's the path of, of, you know, of being able to provide some comfort. So in this context, rut is actually a good thing. It's actually a necessity. Uh, to have that uh, that well-worn path for God's name. Okay, we're good? If I pause like that, I, it's a good time for you to jump in. Just so <laughs> I'm not just thinking of something. I might be thinking of something to say. But the, I want to talk about name real quick. I, yeah, we got time. At my current pace, we should finish. Um, God's name is important. If you, if you win our Wednesday night session, you will remember this. But it's important to remember in the Old Testament Names give insight into character. A name is not simply an identifying mark. A name is, well it is, it's an it's a, a, a identifying mark for the individual. It gives a sense of who a person is. You live into your name in the Old Testament. Usually you live up to it or down to it, as the case may be. Um, whether you're Abraham, maybe the father of many, or you are uh, Isaac, whose name is Laughter, uh, or you are Jacob, whose name is Con Artist, uh, you tend to live into those names. God's name is another way to say God. Talk about God's name is to talk about God's character. Um, the name Yahweh, which only occurs in two verses here, um, it occurs at the beginning of verse one and the end of verse six. So that gives us a nice artistic inclusio there, by the way. So I like to point out the art every now and then. These psalmists were just incredibly gifted, and so we have a beautiful inclusio of Yahweh at the beginning and Yahweh at the end. Um, that name Yahweh is a name that is incredibly difficult to translate, which of course, that's just, that's God, isn't it? I mean, it's, if names give insight into character, God's is a little, you know, it's hard to pin down sometimes. God's kind of vague. Um, it is absolutely connected to the Hebrew word for being, to be, the to be verb. Um, but the tense of it is the question. Now, when the Greek translation was translated, they picked present tense. I am who I am. Uh, which is what Jesus is picking up on in the Gospel of John. All the I am sayings in the Gospel of John identifying with that. That's because their Bible was the Greek Old Testament. In Hebrew, however, it has all of the senses of tense that we have. It has past, it has present, it has future, and it has causative. 
and all of those are possible translations. In other words, you could legitimately translate God's name, I was what I was, or I was what I am, or I was what I will be, or I am what I was, I am what I am, or I am what I will be, or I will be what I was, I will be what I am, or I will be what I will be. In addition to that, it also could be the causative form of the verb. In other words, I am the one who causes to be. I'm creator. And you can use all of those permutations of that one as well. If you like, I didn't memorize all those. I just did the, the nine. That was enough for me. But you can do all of that. So all of that tied up in God's name. Being, creator. And then at the same time, justice, faithfulness, steadfast love. All of that. So God's namesake, when, when we read that, we, just, we can sometimes think of it as an identifier. When they read God's namesake, that is tied right to the paths of righteousness or God's justice or God's uh, faithfulness. All of that is tied into God's name. God as creator, all of that is tied into what, what the name is. And I, I think that's important to sort of dwell on for a second. Did you have a question, Mark? Oh, I'm sorry. It looked like you were waiting for a second. Okay. You were just being thoughtful. <laughs> you being calm. We're good? Let us move on. Verse 4. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Now, let me just take a moment to say, I was a lot older than I care to admit when I noticed something fascinating about verse 4 that has changed from verses 1 through 3. I was much older than I should have been when I noticed this, actually. I was probably in my early 40s when I noticed this. Has anyone else noticed anything interesting? Personal. Yes. Yes, verses one through three, we are in the third person. We are talking about God in verses one through three. The minute the psalmist goes through the darkest valley, we switch to second person and start talking to God. I find that so fascinating and so significant. Um, the darkest valley, it is uh, a compound word in Hebrew, and that word in many cases just means deep darkness. It is a compound word for the words uh, shadow or darkness and death. So I have absolutely no problems with the traditional translation of Psalm 23, the valley of the shadow of death. That is that is very appropriate. It's, it's a very literal rendering of that compound word uh, in that. And it's after being in the valley of the shadow of death that no longer is talking about God sufficient. Now the address goes directly to God in the midst of that circumstance. And I, I think that's wonderfully compelling. I mean, I think many of us who have gone through our share of darkest valleys understand exactly what that's about. That it's one thing to talk about God, but sometimes in those times of crisis, in those times of difficulty, that's when the, the address switches right to second person. You are my rod, and your rod and your staff, you are with me. Um, God with us is not just a New Testament idea. One would hope, because Emmanuel is the Old Testament word. Uh, God is with us, and so that is the theme. God here is abiding. There's a lot of similarities, a lot of connections in this psalm in Isaiah. So, so other, other thoughts on that that we want to talk about? Another bit of art, the word for evil here, very similar in spelling uh, to the word for shepherd. Um, they're the same, almost the same looking word uh, when you go through there. So there's some wonderful play on that as they go through between the word so for shepherd. So you fear no shadow? I fear no evil. I fear no evil. It's a pun. God, the Lord is my shepherd. I fear no evil. Um, it's we can't do that in English, but it's, it's we don't we don't respect puns enough. I don't know what it is about culture that we have. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get my soapbox now. I, I I I'm not good at puns. I'm really not. And the people that are good at puns, when they use puns, are usually met with a remarkable groan from the entire room. Have you noticed this? We seem to be the only culture that does this. You know, someone is gifted in language. Let's humiliate them. I mean, this, this is a weird feel. Everywhere else in the world, right, when someone brings some sort of clever turn of phrase, look at all the look what they did. That was good job. Well done. That was nice. But we just don't. And so, But this is a place where there's a pun going on here. Uh, I, try, I try to have more appreciation for puns, even though I'm not good at it. I, I stopped groaning. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, when I was reading this earlier, uh, the, the last half of it, maybe. Your rod and staff comfort me? Yeah. Yeah. To to me, and again, I think it's a cultural thing. Yeah. Rod and staff are not... Not comforting images? They are not comforting <laughs> to me. Yes. It's like, how are they comforting me? Because 
spare the rod. Yeah, right. <laughs> Spoil the sheep. Yeah, that's I, absolutely. I, that, that was, that's just an I, I think, no, I, I think you're exactly, I think that's a good observation. And I think this is where it helps to remember the metaphor. So this, in this case, it's protection, it's provision, it's, it's knowing that the shepherd has everything the shepherd needs to protect the sheep in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death. Um, I, I'm with you. Isn't the rod and the staff used for guiding? Maybe. Yeah, I've seen a lot of people try to break down, well, the rod was a defensive and the staff was an offensive. I don't know. I mean, it was a rod and a staff. I think it's, it's a poetic text. I always thought of that as the guy. Sure. Okay, cool. I mean, I don't, I don't think you're wrong. <laughs> I don't. Um, at all, I think that that they are they are absolutely implements of a shepherd, and I, I don't I don't want to try to parse too much about out of them, other than to say they are what give the shepherd the ability to protect the sheep, um, move, pick up. If you want to use the, the hook to get us off a cliff, I don't know. I mean, all, whatever it is, or or fight the lions when they show up. Those are the, the shepherd has. I know we're thinking of him using the rod on us, as opposed to the lions that are showing up in the darkest valley. Then we don't have time to unpack all of that today. But, but no, that 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 the shepherd has the ability to protect the sheep. I think is what, what's at work in that, in that text. Absolutely, that's good. Jim, right, you have a thought. Jane stole my thought. Oh, Jane. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Uh, Jane's very very crushing. Okay, we're about to change things here, so verse 5. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. That's an unusual practice for sheep. Um, we don't, don't normally make table sets for sheep or, or have them drink out of cups. This is a, okay, we've jumped metaphors here all of a sudden. I have seen many people try to push this into the shepherd metaphor. Um, and boy, it gets, it's an awkward read uh, when they're doing that. So I, I say what we have now moved to is that of hospitality and provision. Uh, once again, so hospitality, it is hard. We don't think of it as much as they think of it. They thought of hospitality as in, just vital. I've said before, there were no you know, holiday inns as you go. Hospitality was, you had to rely on the hospitality of, of neighbor when you were traveling. You would go into the town. You would sit in the city square, uh, and people would see you and take you in. And when they take you in, they have now acknowledged that they have a responsibility to feed you, to take care of your animals, to wash your feet, to, to, to provide for you, to protect you. you they, they are accepting responsibility for you. And the idea was that you would pay this forward. So as you are traveling, you trust in people taking care of you, and when other people come to your place, you take care of them. This was an expectation. One of the things that we very often miss, you'll see it at the end of the book, uh, at the end of Ezekiel chapter 16. I would not recommend ever reading the book of Ezekiel. Uh, well, okay, that's not exactly true. But I'll let you read the end of book uh, of chapter 16. Bob and I just talked about Ezekiel the other day. <laughs> Have you continued to read Ezekiel? I'm sorry. Slowly. I'm sorry. Um, it's a... I, I've said to many people, I would, I would rather do a Bible study uh, in a, a nursing home on Song of Songs than <laughs> to the book of Ezekiel. It is such a challenge to do that book well. But um, the, uh, the end of chapter 16, God says, explicitly, God says that God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because they didn't show hospitality. That was the reason Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, their lack of hospitality. Um, so hospitality is a huge issue in ancient Israel. It, it happens at the end of the book of Judges. It happens in, in as I say, Ezekiel 16, uh, 48 to 54, that section there is where it's talking about something more. Um, hospitality is a big deal. God is being hospitable here and, and is accepting uh, responsibility for protection um, because in the presence of my enemies, that's, that's again that hospitality image. God is taking me in, God is feeding, my cup is overflowing, God is protecting me. Once again, the rod and staff has come back. The, the God is protecting me. It's another image of provision, another image of protection. Basically, verse 5 is the same as verse 2 and the end of verse 4. Where green pastures, water, rod and staff, that's exactly the same as a table in the presence of my enemies where my cup overflows. Those are the same, the same methods. So in some ways, we're getting another almost a chiastic construction in this beautiful artistic song that we have going on here. I just think that's really good. 
Um, yeah, anointing the head with oil. You saw that in uh, in the New Testament. Jesus is uh, when he enters into houses. The people talk about that, and the, the woman anoints him uh, before he is crucified. And, and so this this is a practice of hospitality. I mean, I've had again, I've had people try to say, well, you know, shepherds would anoint sheep. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I, unaware of that, maybe they do. I don't know, but I think I think we're in a I think we're in a different metaphor here. For some. Yeah. Huh? Could you say a little bit more about anointing and the culture of that time of the Old Testament? I could try. Um, in Hebrew, it is the word Masiach, uh, which gives us the word Messiah, which gives us the word Christos. Um, it is that it just means anointed. Um, kings, it's a, another royal image as well. So that one, I think, must like, much like verse 1, is another subtle royal picture that you have going on there. Um, anointing was done as... Um, Welcome. It is done as um, setting apart. It is done as a sign of of um, generosity to do it to someone else uh, because you're giving your oil for them. Um, but uh, it was obviously done for kings, uh, which is what Jesus the Anointed means. Jesus the Christ. Jesus the Messiah. All kings were called uh, Messiah. All kings were Messiah. Were Messiahs. Uh, Cyrus the Great in Isaiah 45 is Messiah, is Messiah, um, and, and in Greek that just becomes Christos. By the way, I know that word well because I almost forgot how to translate it on my Hebrew preliminary exams in grad school. Um, preliminary exams, we had two weeks worth of exams, Monday, Thursday, Monday, Thursday, eight to one, and I was on my Hebrew test, and I got uh, 1 Samuel 16, this is a traumatic events, they stay with you, don't you? I can even probably say the weather. Um, it was 1 Samuel 16, and I'm going through, and I get to Masiach, and I blanked completely. I was like, Masiach, what is this word? What is this word? And in my mind, I start sort of saying it to myself, and then finally, I started whispering it to myself. You know, on the test, I don't want to say it too loud, but I tried to whisper it to myself, and I was like, Masiach, Masiach, was Masiach, Messiah. I was going to miss the word Messiah. I don't know. <laughs> so I did better after that, but I was ready to just kill myself for that moment. But, uh, yeah, anoint, Masiach. So, yes, yeah, Jim. I hate to you away from yourself. Please, yes, uh, please. <laughs> Obviously, I've been on uh, season therapy. Go ahead. It seems it's probably worth pointing out that uh, the idea of hospitality, mm -hmm. the culture of always protecting you, yes, was not unique to the Hebrew. Oh, of course not. It was and is, remains today, uh, part of the Bedouin society sure. of all the country. Absolutely. Um, particularly in Jordan, if you go there, you'll be impressed. Yes. That, that those who are Bedouin say, we are Bedouin. Exactly. And, and I, I have never known a more, <laughs> I thought my grandmother was intense about how much food you needed to eat when you visited. Um, but Bedouin, Jordanian, uh, Druze, I mean, culture in the Middle East, I have, I have found that I better go hungry um, because you can't refuse it. Uh, they, 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 my cup ran over uh, when I was there. And uh, just compelling you to eat and to welcome and to absolutely hospitality is, and, and and in some ways when you you have to get to a point where you are welcomed in and once you are then it's, it's beautiful and wonderful. Yes, Bob. What's the significance of the table being there in the presence of enemies? It, it's protection. I think that's the image we're getting there. Is that 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 is drawing on that hospitality understanding of of when you take someone in and provide for them, you are providing for their safety. So you are, I am able to not worry, I'm able to eat and I'm able to drink uh, in the presence of my enemies because of you, God. So that, that there is, and, and we're actually- So it's provision slash protection. It is, Okay. it is. And that's, that is something we're about to see alluded to again, because in verse six, surely goodness and mercy shall follow. This is the, probably the one place where I would push back on the translation. I'm okay with most of what happens here, but this one I would want to push back on. That word follow, rodaf, is the word uh, for pursue, to chase. And it is what God's, it is what the psalmist's enemies are always doing in the book of Psalms. My enemies are always pursuing me, following me. And in this psalm, this psalm is taking that and twisting it, and goodness and mercy are pursuing me now all the days of my life because of God. So that is, I think we're still getting an allusion to enemies even in verse six and God's provision. So no longer are his enemies chasing him like they have been up to now in 20, before this and after this. Now it is God's goodness and God's mercy that are pursuing after the psalmist. So, so I do, I think provision and protection 
are what we're getting in this. And that is all tied into hospitality in a way that we don't hear it. You know? So, absolutely. Other thoughts? Yeah, go ahead. This first. Well, I'm having fun here with the sense of your dynamic translation. Oh, good. So I, I'm looking at this and I'm saying, I wonder how it would work to say, the Lord is my president. My president? Yeah, I will, not, I, I will not be in want. And then he will uh, protect me. And, and under his protection, then mm -hmm. he also provides and nourishes me. Mm -hmm. you, you jumped ahead of the story for me. Uh, I got one more verse, and then can I come back to yours? Okay. <laughs> Let me get through this last verse first, because you're pointing out exactly something I was wanting to do. And that is, and, and I want you to go ahead and talk us going now. We'll think about it. Uh, start thinking about how you might update the metaphor. Uh, we got president here. Uh, if you're going to use a dynamic translation of this psalm, what carries with it all the ideas that we've been talking about in contemporary culture, if we want to do it? So think about that. Look at this last verse. I will dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. This one is tricky. Um, the word dwell also uh, looks like the word for return, and it's a word that is a return from uh, exile uh, when that happens. Uh, also, uh, rod and staff comfort me, that word comfort is another word that is used for the return, for the end of the exile. So those two words are words that are used for um, ending exile here, and I, I find that interesting. And so you get that dwell in or return to the house of the Lord. Both of those translations would be appropriate uh, in verse 6. Um, I don't know which one to pick. Um, and my whole, house, whole life long is probably a better translation than forever, because we tend to think of forever in terms of eternity, and I think in ancient Israel, they thought of, of uh, the end of life is what he was. He was thinking of the now, not the, not the eternal. But he was thinking of here as opposed to hereafter. It, that was the way ancient Israel tended to think about it. And so that's, I think, what's happening here. I'll dwell in the, in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Um, well, as long as I'm here, I can do that. So that, that notion of, of dwell, return, either translation is acceptable. I don't know which one to pick. Both, when you read it in Hebrew, both are there. You know, you just you don't have to pick one, but when you pick, when you translate it, you got to make a choice. And uh, so again, Pentecost, right? I mean, I get it, I like it, but it has its drawbacks. So I plan to talk to God about it as well. Long story, long time. Anyway. All right. So there's, there's any questions about translation issues? Anything there? Yes. Can you comment on the House of the Lord? What is that meant for? Yeah, the house of the Lord is in the presence of, mm -hmm. and and it is used for temple. It is used for tabernacle. Um, it is picked up and used for eternity. Um, <laughs> at the end of Ezekiel, it has an eschatological picture of uh, the end times, and that's probably where forever has gotten picked up in the translation. Um, so all of those things are there. So I I don't know if the psalmist is wanting to. Um, live in the temple as one who uh, is faithful and pious like a priest would, uh, or return to the temple after a time of separation going through the valley of the shadow, or or if it's tabernacle, or if it's, as so many of us as Christians do, read it eschatologically and, and think of it as presence of God, as you were saying. All of that's possible. Yeah. So, yes? So, uh, actually, it's a hospitality in so we are Outside, in the house, inside, we... Is the house outside or inside? Um, the, uh, the temple would have had several, it would have been both. There would have been courtyards. Yeah, the hospitality part. Oh, the hospitality part. How to move our family for the enemy or the circumstances outside is how we can move the things out. How should we our life in the hospital? That's very significant to me. Because, because you know, we have only one life. Mm -hmm. We don't have second life. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that I used to do. I don't know what to do. You know. There's something serious that I really need to do. If you think that, you know, I mean, that you know. Being hospi hospitable in those circumstances. It's hard to, it's hard to live that life of hospitality. Yeah, you're exactly right. Yeah. yeah. 
the hospitality concept, but it was played out in the temple in Jerusalem. It was. It was a, a, a courtyard mm -hmm. for foreigners. It was sort of where you go when you're sick, and it's where you go when you're hungry. Absolutely. It's where the, you, the poor can go to get temple alms. It was, yeah, I mean, the, the temple was the metaphor of where heaven met earth. And the picture of ultimately in Genesis 1 where we saw what God was intending all of creation to be, where heaven met earth. I mean, heaven and earth were to meet uh, here. I mean, that was, and that's why in Revelation, new heavens, new earth, and the new, the new Jerusalem, that new city is the Holy of Holies for it, the temple. The whole world is the place where God dwells with God's people, and there's not that separation anymore. Um, and, and God is providing us hospitality in that place, which is, yeah, it's just beautiful beautiful picture of that. All right, so we've had one suggestion for president. Uh, are there other uh, updates for our, our metaphor? Uh, the words, because we don't have anybody shepherd in here? I, didn't, I don't think anybody is or it's a shepherd. Not you're, you're ranchers, yeah, that, that's close, right? <laughs> so um, I don't know that the, the animals feel comforted by the rod and the staff of your parents, so probably less, less so. But, yeah. Well, the more generic there might be leader. Leader. If the president doesn't translate it, it can't. It wouldn't. Yeah. Certainly wouldn't work in Jordan. But, you know, they here. That's fair. <laughs> fair point. You're going to love, I gave my students this exercise. You're going to love what they all decided as a group. It, and, and I can't argue with it. I think it might actually be a pretty darn good one. But I'm not giving it to you yet. I'm going to wait until you guys. That's a tease. I'm going to let you guys wander around. She has one. Some of it as well, you know, got a little mom there uh, as well. So, uh, the Lord is my grandma was where they settled. Which, uh, the more I thought about, it, that's pretty good. That's that's actually a nice, uh, nice image. Uh, Judson. Yeah, when I was Judson. This exercise there is like, okay, update, update it. So we're going to translate into this culture. What do we want? They went with grandma. Bob. How about because so many of us. Gained so many provisions through online shopping. The Lord is my internet connection. <laughs> this is my Wi Fi. Is it? <laughs> I don't think that provided that, that's provision, sure, but I don't think protection is very, very good there. My firewall? No, 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 no. The Lord is my firewall. <laughs> Protects me against denial of service. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Provides me connection with a DDS attack in the midst of DDS attacks. Um, yeah. My password. My password. Yeah, I was uh, actually I've used password. I know actually uh, uh, Eugene Peterson did in Psalm 100. Enter enter his gates with thanksgiving. Uh, enter with the password. And what he was picking up on there was uh, you don't let anyone come into your city that you don't trust. In the same way in our culture, you don't give passwords to people you don't trust. Mm -hmm. And so that's how he was getting to the same. That's, a, that's, the, that's an example of a dynamic equivalence. Ray? So what do you recommend as takeaways from this psalm that is so familiar? Well, I've, obviously we've hit provision and protection a great deal. Um, and uh, hospitality, certainly. But um, 
Comfort. Comfort. Yeah. Maybe that's the question I need to ask you guys. What are the takeaways from the psalm that is so familiar after listening to me today? I can tell you what I want, but what do you get? Comfort. God's provision, God's protection, the ruts of righteousness. I, I, for me, I think a lot of times I have heard this used in funerals. And right. Because funerals use it so often, you see both the grieving and then the, uh, the hope. Mm -hmm. uh, you see the bigger picture yeah. that um, it seems to describe. And so I mean, it's probably overused mm -hmm. the more I've listened to you today. It's overused in funeral settings and we miss a lot of the context of and, what, it was, what it's supposed to be telling yeah. us. Yeah. And I think that was, that was going to be my concluding remark is that we have, we have used this in funerals so much, we can tend to think this is only a psalm that speaks to grief and dying. There's a lot of living in this psalm. And, and there's a lot about living in this psalm and, and struggling in shadow of death and speaking to God in the midst of shadow of death and moving from talking about to talking to in the, after going through that shadow of death valley kind of situation. Um, provision for, for needs, uh, protection. For, I mean, that, there's a lot of living here more so than there is. I, mean, I think there are better psalms for grieving than Psalm 23, um, but you just can't run against this because it's all anyone knows. Jane? Well, especially considering the the possibility of substituting president sure. for, for Shepherd. Just generalizing it a little bit more as sort of a, a goal <laughs> that this is this is what we should have. Mm -hmm. This is what we need and then just sort of build around that. That's true. That's, I mean, that's true. I've been talking about it today from the perspective of the, she the sheep. Um, it is, there is a lesson here for shepherds. There is a lesson here for responsibility and provision and protection and comfort and, and all of that. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's, that's probably a good point to, to think about. Yeah. What struck me is the absence of something. Okay. There's no lamenting. No, nope, not here. You know, it's pure happiness. It is, this is a psalm of praise. Yeah. Uh, but that's okay, because 22 is just right before it, so we're good. Uh, there's plenty of laments here. Yeah. I think one of the things that I like about this is when they talk about my, my cup overflow. Yeah. And I see that as people have different sized cups, but they're all <laughs> overflowing. No matter what your cup is, it's overflowing. I think that's a probably a good, so good lesson. So that's the one part of it that I like. And then talking about the present, maybe it should be the whole government. Yeah. All of us. I, I, boy, I'm going to think about community for a while. That's a good My accountability community. That's a good idea. All right. Well, have a good day. Thanks so much. We're going to do Psalm 82 and in, next week. And in way of a tease, Psalm 82, the most important scripture in the entire Bible. That's not an oversight. So I'll prove it. Yes. Coffee cups, put them where? Right there. Okay. You got coffee cups, put them right there. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>
She is. She is uh, up.